Today we continue uh, in the field of superconductivity uh, focusing on uh, this uh, family of effects uh, proposed theoretically by Josephson um, and uh, these are not just physical phenomena, it is a very natural for our course to study this because um, it all happens in a device. The, the building block is a Josephson junction, a, a junction between two superconductors. And pretty much any effect you can imagine related to this concept is uh, another device. So many interesting uh, effects. And uh, um, in subsequent le lectures, we will see more devices based on superconductors and Josephson effect, including uh, quantum bits um, at the end. So uh, last uh, week we uh, focused on uh, a piece of superconductor and uh, I asked you to think about uh, a superconductor in a very simple way as a wave function. It's one piece of superconductor, uh, all the Cooper pairs uh, is a complicated many body state but they are all condensed in a Bose-Einstein condensate in a ground state protected by the superconducting gap from excitations. And all of those Cooper pairs are in exactly the same state, described by one complex number with an amplitude which is proportional uh, to the square root of density uh, and uh, a phase. So in principle, a whole piece of superconductor would be determined by this one complex number. And today we are going to study uh, systems where two pieces of superconductor are in close proximity to each other. Very close proximity with a little gap which is called a barrier um, and this barrier can be vacuum, can be a dielectric insulator, can be a metal, can be a semiconductor and pretty much in all these situations the barrier is small enough you can see the Josephson effects. The Josephson effect is a flow of supercurrent between two distinct disconnected pieces of superconductor. That's what Josephson effect is. If you think about it, it's quite remarkable because um, in this region in between there is no conditions for superconductivity. There is no attractive interaction between the two electrons. There are no there is no condensate. Uh, none of that is there. Uh, yet somehow uh, through this uh, piece of dielectric or metal, current can flow without dissipation. The supercurrent can flow. So even though it's a, if you just put this piece of, uh, let's say, let's stick a piece of copper in between. Put a piece of copper and measure it separately on your table it will always have resistance, no matter the temperature. At the lowest temperature, it will still have finite resistance. Put it in between two superconductors, and you can pass a current without any resistance. So that is very remarkable, and uh, that's called the Josephson effect. And uh, the notion behind this effect, why this works, is because um, you can think of this wave function on the left uh, overlapping with the wave function on the right because they are close. So like uh, wave functions of simple electrons, not Cooper pairs, overlapping over a tunneling barrier and allowing electrons to go from one side to the other. Same way wave functions of Cooper pairs overlap and uh, form sort of a single wave function over the barrier. Something like this. Um, here I show superconductor on the left, superconductor on the right, uh, a tunneling barrier in between, a constant wave function here and a constant wave function here inside the superconductor and outside the superconductor I allow them to uh, slowly decay. Or maybe they decay fast, it depends on the materials. Uh, I motivated it to you in the last lecture when I mentioned to you the proximity effect. right? So this, this is possible uh, if you imagine that this barrier is a metal, electrons can just fly into here and for a while they will remember each other's phases. So they will 
think they're a Cooper pair for an evanescent time. Also works with a dielectric or vacuum, actually. The quantum mechanical wave function can go in, in under the barrier. And uh, if the two are close enough, there will be an overlap. And in the dashed line, I plot the sum of the two-wave function, nothing more. Well, approximately. So going from left to right, this wave function, also called the order parameter, exhibits a, a kind of a weak spot. The amplitude's reduced, but if it's not reduced to zero, Cooper pairs can go from left to right. And they can carry supercurrent. So Jolison effect can be thought of as a tunneling of Cooper pairs. One thing is not plotted here in this graph is uh, the phase. Well, or you could say the phase of the left superconductor is the same as the phase of the right superconductor. But uh, as the two pieces are distinct, disconnected, in principle, the two phases don't have to be the same. In general, they can be different. And the phase difference across the junction is the key parameter to everything we're going to talk about today. It determines all the properties of Josephson junctions. So the phase drop across the tunnel barrier, phi mi 1 minus phi 2, delta phi. And uh, for a large fraction of the talk, I will just forget to write this delta. I will just write phi, just phase. And I will call it phase because, of course, phase is additive. I can just subtract a constant. Uh, from, from somewhere in the phase. And, uh, but it's the phase difference. I want you to keep in mind that whenever I, I'll be talking about phase, it will always be the phase difference between the two pieces of superconductor that matters. It affects the physical properties. And why that uh, quantity matters? It's because this macroscopically quantum coherent state and this macroscopically quantum coherent state form one coupled state. And uh, in order for supercurrent to flow, we have to maintain phase coherence. If we lose phase coherence, and this quantity does not matter, then Cooper pairs cannot travel from one superconductor to the other over a piece of copper and still create no dissipation, still remain in a condensed state. So phase coherence is important. If you ever get to measure a Josephson junction, um, you would get an uh, IV characteristic which may look like this. Uh, in this case, uh, what they, uh, well, this is a cartoon, but what you would have to do to measure this kind of characteristic is you would have to sweep the current, and up to some critical current, there will be no voltage across the junction. So after the critical current, the junction often rapidly switches as a jump into the finite voltage state, after which it behaves kind of like a resistor. The line that goes through here extrapolates to zero. So this region is often called the normal state of a Josephson junction. And this is the supercurrent state. You can see uh, that this is uh, by no means a linear IV. Uh, especially n clearly not down here. So if you put, make a circuit that includes the Josephson junction as an element, uh, this will not be a linear circuit. It will be distinctly different from circuits that have resistors, capacitors, inductors. Uh, those circuits we understand very well. But this will be uh, nonlinear, and so you would have to uh, apply its own logic. It has its own logic. The other examples of nonlinear elements are tunnel junctions, uh, diodes, transistors, etc. They also come with their own logic. So uh, when Josephson uh, theoretically uh, envisioned this effect, um, everyone said that he was crazy. Uh, actually, turned out to be true later on, but for a different reason. <laughs> but um, the reason why they said he was crazy was because uh, 
to think about this tunneling, uh, people broke it down into tunneling of single electrons. And uh, the probability of two electrons tunneling and being a Cooper pair here and then forming a Cooper pair again here was thought to be very small. And then, so Josephson understood that that amplitude is actually not small if you think about Cooper pairs uh, tunneling. And when he uh, derived his original equations, uh, he uh, um, came up with this formula, which connects the supercurrent flowing uh, in the junction, so not the critical current, but the supercurrent at the given moment of time, uh, to the phase drop across the junction. So the critical current then is just a constant. And uh, very simple formula, supercurrent with an amplitude of the critical current is proportional to sine of the phase difference. And that is often called the first Josephson relation. And uh, he, he came up with two. So we will talk about the second one later. So coming back to this experiment, if we slowly ramp up the current, and we are still in the supercurrent state, right? We increase the current, and uh, according to this equation, we are winding the phase. We are creating a phase difference across the junction, because the two are connected, right? So what would be the phase difference at the critical point, point at the critical current value? So just uh, the sine becomes 1. Right? We would be at the phase difference of pi over 2. So as we go from here to here, we will be going from 0, right? For 0 current, phase difference is 0, or 2 pi, or 4 pi. And as we increase, we will be going from 0 to pi over 2 over a sinusoidal curve. And then we exceed the critical current and uh, something else happens, which we will discuss later in the talk. OK, a couple words about uh, the most important examples of Josephson junctions, at least uh, for this course. Um, uh, th these are on technology. You already seen this method before when I talked about tunnel junctions. Uh, this is the shadow technique where uh, you uh, create a uh, suspended mask over your substrate and then uh, you put it in the evaporator and atoms in the ultra high vacuum electron beam evaporator come down in straight lines so you can deposit them at one angle then at another angle and uh, so you will form overlaps between the two layers and in between the two layers if you put a bunch of oxygen in this chamber you will oxidize the surface of the bottom layer and therefore, here you will create a tunnel junction. Well, if you oxidize for a kind of a long time, this tunnel barrier will be quite thick. And it will be a very good tunnel junction. Uh, and then there will be no supercurrent, because the tunneling barrier is too high. So if you oxidize a little bit less, and the two superconductors, in this case, this works most uh, often with aluminum the two layers of aluminum are a little bit closer, then Cooper pairs can tunnel. And so with the same technique, you can create good tunnel junctions, also excellent Josephson superconductor, insulator superconductor junctions. So this all relies on the fact that this aluminum oxide is an excellent oxide. It grows very uniformly without any holes and uh, with a very thin layer that it can be very well controlled what the thickness of that layer is. And so these junctions are very often used in quantum transport experiments and uh, for most of the superconducting qubits, for example. Here's an example of a, of a qubit. Uh, I think uh, this is uh, a sample that was uh, fabricated in Germany in the group of Alexei Ustinov. Um, here uh, he made a, a little loop with uh, three overlap areas, which are these tiny Josephson junctions of aluminum, aluminum oxide. So this is how it might look. This scale bar is one micron. So these are 
much smaller than a micron. Um, and uh, you have to use electron beam lithography to define these patterns. And uh, you also see shadows in this picture. So because you first deposit at this angle, and then at that angle, everything is doubled. Uh, so you can see this shape and then offset from it another shape. And uh, it's the overlap of the doubled shapes that they control with angles of deposition and create these junctions. So this is a prototype of a something that is called a three Josephson junction flux qubit. We will discuss it in, uh, in next week, I think. Uh, the next, uh, yeah. This is another technology that is uh, very mature, also very reliable, uh, and it is called the niobium trilayer junctions. Uh, the there's a bunch of layers, but the important ones are they deposit a layer of niobium, which is a, a much stronger superconductor than aluminum. Then they cover it with aluminum. Then they oxidize, like in the previous step. They oxidize, and then they put a layer of niobium on top. So they make a sandwich of niobium, aluminum, aluminum oxide, niobium. And then they chop this sandwich up and uh, make circuits out of it. So uh, this... Uh, whole bunch of layers is a, is a process which is a factory uh, quality process developed by this company Hypris uh, and uh, they call it Niobium IC. If you see at the top there, Niobium Integrated Circuit Process. This is uh, from their website. You can download the manual for how to design circuits uh, for rules for all these layers and submit it to them and they will give you chips with your circuits and this is used by uh, several research groups uh, around the world uh, for uh, magnetic sensors um, and things like that based on uh, Josephson junctions. Uh, also by this company D-Wave, uh, I believe, in, in Canada. I think at, at least at some point they purchased their chips from, uh, from Hypris. Maybe not anymore, but uh, they used to. So they would order a circuit um, and it will come. Uh, also by um, a community which uh, tried to create uh, computers based on uh, Josephson junctions. So not on, based on silicon semiconductors but on something called rapid single flux quantum RSFQ logic. This is an example of such circuits. Here the analogy to integrated circuits is uh, quite applicable because this is also a computing circuit where uh, classical, not quantum logic operations, are done with uh, magnetic fields created in the loops of Josephson junctions. And um, so here are a bunch of different Josephson junctions. Some are uh, bigger, some are smaller. Uh, other elements include inductors. Um, and the reason why you have so many layers, in addition to this important one, is because you want to connect different junctions with uh, with superconducting interconnects. And also maybe create shunt resistors, etc. So some of these are shunt resistor layers, some are interconnects, and some are dielectrics to separate different layers. So this is a, uh, a very highly controlled technology, niobium Josephson junctions. Here's something you should be able to relate to, because I've been talking about the these materials uh, for a large fraction of the course. Um, Josephson junctions based on uh, semiconductor nanowires, carbon nanotubes, graphene, etc. Also many new materials like topological insulators, um, uh, oxide two decks, etc. Um, call them hybrid uh, junctions because uh, uh, they came a little bit after uh, the development of those other types of junctions like uh, aluminum and niobium, and they uh, couple semiconductors to superconductors. So this uh, was a long challenge um, for technical reasons. Uh, and, and therefore, when, when all of this became possible with high quality in, in these new materials, you see the papers uh, got very a lot of attention and got into uh, big journals. Uh, but actually, the physics that they study it goes back to the 1960s, to the original work of Josephson. 
Um, after the fact, uh, the uh, devices uh, appear to be very simple. You take, for example, a semiconductor nanowire and you put two aluminum electrodes on it. And so the, the contact is good enough, then the current flows from one electrode to the other without dissipation. So it's a super current. Here's a current on this axis. And uh, they sweep the current and they get no voltage until at some point it switches to this other state. In this case, the junction is actually hysteretic. So the red trace is going in this direction. And then when they sweep it back, it stays in the resistive state for longer. And it switches back to superconducting state at a different point. So at IR, re, re, it's called a retrapping current. Critical current and re, retrapping current. So it, uh, the junction is retrapped back into the superconducting state. Uh, we will uh, discuss why that happens in later slides. But this sh shows you that uh, uh, this is not simply a, um, ju uh, an element where up to some parameter it's a zero resistor, and after another parameter, when its parameter is exceeded, it's a finite resistor. It's much more than that. It's, it's, uh, there's something strange nonlinear going on in this junction. Here for a carbon nanotube, um, a little bit hard to see, the beautiful Fabry-Perot data. You should uh, look at this paper uh, if you want to study it. But um, what the data shows is um, a critical current now, which is uh, tunable by gate. So these uh, values are for different settings of a, of a back gate, a VG underneath the nanotube. So it seems that in a semiconductor, you can affect the value of the critical current by sweeping the gate. Just like you could affect conductance in a quantum dot or a quantum point contact by a gate, you can also affect the supercurrent. You can do all these same experiments in graphene. Now, with those uh, hybrid semiconductor systems in mind, um, let's go back to Andreev reflection and try to understand uh, from this uh, perspective what gives rise to supercurrent. Um, what gives rise to supercurrent is something called Andreev bound states. First, let's look at, at one side of this junction and uh, remind ourselves what Andreev reflection is. Andreev reflection is a mechanism through which uh, electrons can enter the superconductor. Right? Electron comes to the superconductor and uh, it is reflected as a whole with the opposite energy. So a Cooper pair then goes this way into the superconductor and charge is conserved because we gave one electron and we extracted a hole. So we transferred the charge of 2E per Andreev reflection into the superconductor. Um, and the energy works because this one is plus E, this one is minus E, and Cooper pair has zero. So energy is conserved. Um, charge is conserved, so this is allowed, and it does happen. Uh, now, let's think what happens if uh, there is another superconductor on this side. Well, so if you come with an electron, you do this Andreev reflection here, you go back, you do another Andreev reflection, and uh, you send a Cooper pair this way, maybe, and then uh, you can go back. So you can kind of go in a loop in this process. So this is now at zero bias, so different from multiple Andreev reflection, where at each bounce, the two um, electrons were gaining energy from bias. Uh, at zero bias, uh, this will just go in an infinite loop. And actually, it is not so different from a quantum dot, if you think about it. Because this electron hole particle, which 
goes as an electron, comes back as a hole, and, and does, does this loop, this particle is bound in between the two superconductors. It is not bound exactly like an electron in a box, because at every reflection, a Cooper pair is uh, kind of nucleates and goes into the superconductor. But that's OK, because the number of Cooper pairs in the superconductor is not conserved. It's the bosons, so you can throw as many of them as you like in. Uh, but it is like a quantum dot, because uh, um, these uh, states form a discrete spectrum due to the confinement between the two superconductors. So the condition for them to form the spectrum is very simple. It's like wave matching uh, solution, like, like in a particle in a box or an interferometer. Uh, you have to uh, make sure that as electron goes and comes back, the phase accumulated in this entire process is uh, equal to 2 pi. So like a, like a bohr sommerfeld model in an atom, right? You have to fit a number of wavelengths inside a trajectory on, a, on an orbital. The same way, very simple. Um, and uh, just that simple condition would give you a spectrum of these Andreev bound states for each junction. Here are some uh, extremely simple uh, calculations. Um, the phase uh, difference can come from just the phase difference between the two superconductors. Phi 1 minus phi 2, that's the quantity we discussed in the first slide. Uh, then there could be a phase difference accumulated between electron and hole if uh, there is no perfect symmetry between them. Um, and that, that would scale with length of the junction. And then there's this term that uh, comes from uh, the uh, confinement energy scale, the gap. Because the, the height of the potential barrier is the gap. So if we are in a fairly short junction, and this term is irrelevant, or if we have perfect particle hole symmetry, uh, we can also put this to zero and uh, extract energy from here. We will get that the energies of the Andreev bound states in this uh, kind of simplified situation are proportional to the cosine of phase over 2. And again, remember, this phi, this phase, it's a phase difference between the two superconductors. A phase drop across the junction. So once again, this phase drop plays a role in the energy spectrum of Andreev bound states in, uh, in this superconductor, normal metal superconductor junction. If it's a very long junction and uh, this term dominates, then we actually get a something that's uh, very simple, uh, energy evolves linearly with phase. And then another important thing about these states is that they always come in pairs. That's due to particle hole symmetry. Uh, but uh, the reason, uh, the easy way to understand this plus minus sign is the following. Uh, Remember, I'm showing you that uh, electron starts from here and becomes a hole. There is another state where a hole starts from here and becomes an electron. So the, the state that goes in the opposite direction. And that will have the kind of like the opposite energy. So then we talk about hole-like Andreev bound states and electron-like Andreev bound states. And they will always be symmetric with respect to zero energy. Andreev bound states have been measured directly and indirectly many times. Uh, I want to show you a recent uh, beautiful experiment from France uh, where single Andreev bound states were detected in a carbon nanotube. Uh, this is their device. Um, it is uh, a carbon nanotube. I don't know if you can see it, but it's this hair in the picture over here. Um, and uh, they've made an aluminum device around it using the same shadow technique, uh, like for tunnel junctions. But um, they, they didn't really uh, oxidize anything. But uh, the reason why they use this shadow technique is to um, create this um, 
different uh, electrode in the middle. So the Josephson junction is between the green and the green, and this guy is a tunneling probe on top. It's on top of the nanotube. So what they, uh, the difference between them is that when they, before putting the green layer, they, they cleaned a bit, I think, uh, the nanotube. So they made a very good contact here. Um, and for this one, they didn't, so it works as a tunneling probe. So the, the, it's, a, it's a higher uh, potential barrier to get in. So what they have is a, a way to do spectroscopy on this Josephson junction from a tunneling probe. Um, and uh, what they also introduced here is this loop. We will talk about loops uh, in the next lecture, but um, just to motivate it for you for now, this loop allows them to uh, adjust the phase difference between the fork, between the two green electrodes. The way that works is they put magnetic flux into this loop. And uh, this flux creates a phase difference between the two superconductors, similar to uh, Aron of Bohm interferometers, any other interferometers. Uh, so I realize I did not uh, touch on this in this course, uh, but uh, just um, for now, s I want you to think about loop as a phase control mechanism, to create a phase difference. So then when they uh, sweep the phase, they just sweep actually current through some coil to change the flux in this loop. Um, they see uh, in their uh, tunneling characteristics uh, these lines that, that wiggle around. So the measurement is send a voltage bias from here to the superconductor. So current goes here into the nanotube, splits around and goes, goes out. But from the red to the nanotube, it has to tunnel. And so we are doing a, a tunneling spectroscopy experiment, like scanning tunneling microscope, or tunneling from a normal lead onto a quantum dot. So if we have a quantum level aligned with the voltage bias that we apply, uh, we will observe a resonance in transmission. So it's a similar concept as uh, in uh, quantum dot lectures. So they identified these resonances as Andreev bound states because they had this characteristic dependence on phase. This is a line cut. Uh, one of the states is a, a superconducting gap. They, they uh, assign it to delta. So remember from last lecture, at the edge of the superconducting gap, we have an anomaly. So that will show up as a resonance. In transmission, if you tunnel from a normal metal to the superconductor, there will be a resonance at the gap. And below the gap, these uh, phase-dependent resonances are Andreev bound states. And it looks, uh, I guess, I think you will all agree that uh, it looks like they have uh, some kind of a sinusoidal or cosinusoidal dependence on the phase. And that is very typical. And remember, the Josephson equation was a sine phi term. So pretty much in most of the junctions that we study, it will be a sine phi or a cosine phi one way or another. What they also could do in this device is, of course, sweep a gate. The, the gate in this case is a back gate. It's a layer underneath the substrate, this one. And they saw that uh, these resonances also change as a function of gate voltage. Uh, there is some periodicity related to the period of Coulomb peaks when they add another electron on a quantum dot on a nanotube. Um, so this is also in agreement with what uh, they found earlier when they saw that the supercurrent depends on the gate. So then uh, if a uh, spectrum of Andreev bound states which carry supercurrent from left to right depends on the gate. And also the supercurrent will depend on the gate. Okay. So once again, in a superconductor, normal metal superconductor junction, 
confined by the superconducting gap on two sides, electrons will form Andreev bound states, which go like this. Electron goes into a hole, and in one cycle of this, a Cooper pair is transferred from left to right. And because phase coherence is maintained, energy of these states is even dependent on phase. That is why the two condensates on the left and on the right are coupled, uh, and the current can flow without dissipation. This is like one-way function going through this Andreev stage. And it's perfectly fine to also think about this process as just the overlap of the wave functions on the left and on the right. Uh, Andreev uh, method is uh, uh, very powerful, uh, gives uh, uh, very good predictions, as I will show you in the later slides, and uh, uh, very useful for many of the new experiments uh, to think about it in terms of Andreev states. Now let's um, think about what happens if you have not a superconductor normal metal where electrons can fly, uh, but a superconductor insulator structures. Well, if you just have two wave functions here and here, they will just have to overlap through the insulator and allow for the tunneling process to occur. Uh, you can go continuously from one regime to the other keeping in mind the notion of Andreev bound states. So I want to, to show you this as an example. Uh, let's start here, and let's make a, a little break here, like a little mirror that reflects these states with some small probability. Um, then it turns out that the formula for Andreev bound states from this converts into this. So the difference is this tau is a transmission of uh, an Andreev bound state. So if an Andreev bound state has a finite transmission from here to here, you have to add this tau. And I'm not deriving the formulas here because they're fairly basic and I want to go forward. So if you are curious how it's derived, uh, look it up. Now, if um, we increase this gap more and more, we can think about uh, two sets of Andreev bound states. One is on the left side and one is on the right side. We can even infinitely shrink this, this guy. Um, and then what uh, you have to think about is Cooper pairs undergo Andreev reflection here, then the electrons tunnel, another Andreev reflection here, and they get out. So this is how you could continuously go in your mind from Andreev states to tunneling. You just have to introduce tunneling between two uh, pairs of Andreev bound states. Now what happens in the spectrum is that um, when you introduce this uh, tunneling between Andreev bound states, you hybridize the hole-like and the electron-like uh, branches of this process. Because uh, on one side, you start with an electron-like state, and it has to tunnel into the hole-like state on the other side. So instead of this crossing here, you will get an anti-crossing level repulsion, which is proportional to the uh, transmission of this barrier. And an interesting thing happens that um, these lines, these Andreev states are 4 pi periodic, because it's a cosine phi over 2. And these, due to this hybridization, become 2 pi periodic. In practice, also in this junction, uh, what will happen if you sweep the phase, for example, is that you will always stay in the ground state. So your, all your current and voltage characteristics, energies, will be 2 pi periodic, because you will go from here to the ground state here, unless these are completely decoupled. And you have no way of going from one to the other. OK. I told you sine phi, sine phi, sine phi. Yes, it is uh, the case in most junctions. If you put two superconductors together, most likely it will be uh, something like sine phi in between them. But there are many important examples where it's not the case. Um, and there you have to take into account what happens in the barrier. Uh, first of all, over here, 
we have a case of a point contact, a quantum point contact, or just a classical point contact, a very clean, narrow constriction. It turns out, in that case, the current phase relation, if transmission is very high, it is almost linear. Remember, like those Andreev bound states um, had a linear term, Kf times L? Well, if that dominates, the current phase relation will be linear. So current or energy versus phase will be linear. But then if you uh, lower the transmission and the Andreev bound states will couple, it goes into something that looks like a sign at low transmission. So from ballistic regime to tunneling regime, you go from linear to transmission. And now this function up here, um, you can think about it as a straight line, or you could also decompose it into harmonics of a sine function. If sine function is your base, uh, this, uh, these skewed functions will just simply have higher harmonics in addition to sine. And these higher harmonics have an interesting interpretation. Uh, you can interpret them as a higher order processes of uh, Cooper pair tunneling. If a single Cooper pair tunneling gives you sine phi term, the sine 2 phi term is like two Cooper pairs tunneling. And uh, you can make those processes is dominate in clean structures. So you can observe higher order Josephson effects in, in uh, specially designed experiments. Here's a curious example that I spent several years of my life studying. Um, it is a sinusoidal current phase relation, but it's flipped. You can see that a sine function goes down as we increase the phase. So uh, it is as if uh, the sine function is shifted by pi, or if the, you can also say a critical current is negative. What, what, whatever you, concept you are more more uh, happy with, you can also say that the minimum energy of this junction is at pi, but we did not introduce this energy yet and the, the connection of the two. Um, so I think we will return to this maybe in the next lecture, uh, but this is just a, another example of what can happen in a Josephson junction. Um, and then very recently um, theoreticians have proposed that you just take these Andreev bound states, and if it's really forbidden to go uh, from uh, the lower branch to the upper branch of this point, you will just stay on this line, then from 2 pi periodic current phase relation, you can go to 4 pi periodic current phase relation, and what protects this transition is a uh, Majorana fermion. So very often, you will read in Majorana papers that uh, a smoking gun evidence for Majoranas is this 4 pi period in the, in the Josephson effect. And um, I think the recent uh, uh, understanding in this is a little bit of a red herring because if you start on this lower uh, Andreev state and then go up, here it's an excited state, and so the the phase particle, remember this is a phase difference, it can fall down to this state. And so you will never see the 4 pi period in a real experiment. But uh, this has been proposed as a very exotic, this is probably the most exotic of these, all of these effects. Now we come to the second Josephson relation. And uh, this one is a, uh, has to do with uh, very important area, what happens above the critical current, and also with the time-dependent uh, property of Josephson junctions. So again, without deriving it, I will postulate for this lecture that if you apply a voltage bias to a Josephson junction, a phase difference across the junction will change in a linear fashion with that voltage it will just start winding in time. So at the time zero when you turn on the voltage, the phase difference will start going linear with the slope which is 2e over h, only fundamental constants. It's kind of amazing. You can take a aluminum junction, a nanotube junction, a graphene junction, always the same evolution of the phase. 
So it's a very fundamental relation. And uh, it also tells you that even above the critical current, it is not just a resistor. Yeah, I already mentioned it to you from the hysteresis, but also from this you can see uh, we are in a finite voltage state, so we have some voltage on the junction. Um, and um, it could even be that up here Ohm's law applies pretty well. It's a linear change. But we know that underneath this, there is something happening to the phase. What is happening to the phase? It's changing all the time. So apply two voltage between the two superconductors, and the phase starts going, running away from you. The phase difference between the two. So one very simple exercise, just plug this in to here. This is the first Josephson relation, the sinusoidal one. You will get, at the finite voltage bias, a constantly changing phase, and this sine function will oscillate. So this, coupled to this, dictates to us that at the finite voltage, we actually have an AC supercurrent flowing through the junction at the frequency determined by the voltage. And the AC current actually leads to radiation. So people have detected Josephson radiation by uh, detectors that were hooked up to Josephson junctions. This effect is real. It does not show up here because this is a time average measurement. It's a DC characteristic, so at each point we average for many seconds. Uh, so if we could see in real time what's going on, at this point there will be some oscillating current creating radiation. So this dynamics is what gives rise to, at least in part, to this normal state resistance. But it is very hard to see this radiation. It is fairly small in amplitude. And uh, if you do any DC measurement, it time averages. So people have to do sophisticated measurements to see it. Uh, but uh, it is um, actually very easy to see the manifestations of this uh, second relation. But you have to do the reverse experiment. You have to apply microwave frequency, apply high frequency, and the current voltage characteristics change very dramatically. So under microwave excitation, current voltage characteristic from this becomes a staircase of very sharp steps. So current versus voltage becomes a bunch of steps. These are several curves at different uh, amplitude of excitation at a certain frequency, uh, about a megahertz in this case, I think. And the highest one, going all the way up here and switching, uh, has no steps. That's because uh, the excitation was at zero. So this is the critical current of this junction. Now we apply uh, AC excitation at high frequency and the critical current suppresses, and these steps appear. So these are called Shapiro steps. And the reason why they appear, I'll tell you uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, but what's remarkable about them is that you can always predict the frequency, uh, uh, the voltage at which they appear, because it's related to frequency that you excite with by uh, this relation. And you can track this relation back to there. So this coefficient here is a Josephson frequency coefficient. And the frequency is just given by the voltage. So it's a rate of change of the phase. So when you match the voltage bias across the junction, this is the voltage bias across the junction, which creates this phase dynamics with an external excitation at the same frequency, you get some kind of resonances. Yeah. So once again, phase across the junction at finite voltage evolves according to this. So it has a certain frequency, which is this Josephson frequency. You plug it into the sinusoidal function. 
Uh, and if we match that frequency with an external excitation, we get these dramatic resonances, which are called Shapiro steps. And that is very easy to see in an experiment. So now let's introduce uh, the Josephson energy. Um, there is an energy scale associated with the Josephson junction. It's called the Josephson energy. And the way you derive it is like any other energy. It's a free energy stored inside the junction. So we have to take I times V times dt in order to ramp up the current. We have to uh, apply a voltage um, uh, for a given time. But V times dt, according to what I just said in the last slide, is d phi, which is the phase difference. So energy is related to supercurrent as an uh, integral over phase. Or in other words, supercurrent is a derivative of energy by phase. So that's really easy to remember. Because if your supercurrent is a sine function, energy will be a cosine function. So for a sine function, energy will be a cosine function. This cosine function is a particular shape, which is 1 minus cosine. That's what you get from uh, uh, sine phi. And uh, that tells you that the energy difference prefers to be at 0 in this junction. That is the lowest energy state. And now the coefficient in this formula, this is the Josephson energy. So the, the scale of energy, maximum energy, is given by the critical current with some, again, some fundamental constants. So critical current of the junction is proportional to this energy scale of the Josephson junction, which is called Ej. Now let's uh, think a little bit more about realistic uh, Josephson junctions. I just explained to you that uh, it would be characterized by a certain energy Ej, free energy stored inside the junction from uh, the phase evolution of the wave function, of the overlap of the two wave functions in two superconductors. Uh, but if the junction is small enough, this uh, familiar energy scale will also play a role, the charging energy. Because if the capacitance is small, this can be quite large. So if we just put these two terms together, we can write a Hamiltonian for a Josephson junction, which includes the capacitive term with the number of Cooper pairs, uh, hence the 4 here, because the charge is 2, and the energy term, which is uh, proportional to cosine phi, which is the integral over sine phi for the supercurrent. So in such junctions, like I showed you for uh, small aluminum circuits, with very small junctions, this charging energy can actually play a big role in, uh, in the properties of these junctions. And that leads us to a, a very um, simple an intuitive way to think about this uh, phase difference. Um, I will uh, go through these equations. They're very simple. Uh, but um, basically what we're doing here is uh, uh, trying to calculate the total current that flows through the junction, uh, including all of its properties, the Josephson current and the capacitance and the finite resistance. Um, but what we will arrive to is, an un, is a very intuitive picture for how to think about uh, Josephson junctions. So if we want to calculate uh, the current uh, armed with not the uh, uh, Schrodinger equation, but with the circuit elements, uh, with these parameters like the Josephson energy and the capacitance and the normal state resistance, we use this model, which is called the RSJ model, resistively shunted junction model, and sometimes RSCJ model, where C is the capacitive. Uh, and it is literally this model. Current can flow 
um, rather than thinking that it flows from one superconductor to the other, we think that it flows through a parallel connection of a Josephson element, resistive element, and a capacitor. And a Josephson element is characterized by this Josephson relation. Or you have to plug in something else here if you have a non-sinusoidal element. Uh, but uh, this is a nonlinear part because uh, this current depends on some parameter phase. So it's not an Ohm's law element. This guy is related to uh, what happens at a finite voltage, right? Uh, so it's related to the second Josephson relation. And uh, instead of writing V equal to some constants over phase derivative, we write I times R. And this R is a normal state resistance. It's a constant characterizing the junction. And then this is the displacement current. So the, this current is uh, uh, this one. And so we know that V is uh, proportional to d phi dt. So dV dt for the displacement current is proportional to the second derivative of phase. And we have all these prefactors. Critical current, resistance, and capacitance of the Josephson junction, which we just plug into this model. Uh, now let's put it all together. The total current is the sum of the three. And it turns out that it's uh, proportional to second derivative of phase, first derivative of phase, and uh, sinusoidal term. Now does this equation look familiar? wave equation, uh, previous semester of physics, LCR, or even, even an earlier semester? Yeah, I would say it's a pendulum. Except what is, what is swinging? Phase difference is swinging. Phase difference is swinging on a pendulum. So uh, we started with uh, something very obscure, phase difference that determines all the properties of this junction. Now all we need to think about is a ball in this kind of a periodic sinusoidal potential. Yeah, because we have this sin phi term, which gives us the sinusoidal potential. And this slope turns out to be an external bias the current bias. So if we, if we sit, it becomes a pendulum if we only consider this region down here, or a harmonic oscillator, right? If we want to consider this entire landscape, uh, the proper words to say are that it is a mechanical ball inside a washboard potential, or a tilted washboard potential. The washboard is this thing where you can wash your clothes if you don't have a, a laundry machine. Um, very good device, but uh, maybe they have to come up with a new analogy because uh, in modern times people probably don't use that anymore. Uh, but we use it in the Josephson physics, so uh, it's still useful. Now let's look more closely at this um, equation. I wrote it again up there. So this equation describes the evolution of a phase particle, which is, remember, the phase difference between the two superconductors across the Josephson junction, but I'm just going to call it the particle from now on, in the washboard potential. And so the term which is uh, in front of the second derivative of the coordinate, acceleration. That's the acceleration. What's in front? It's mass. So mass is capacitance. This is the analogy. Capacitance of the Josephson junction is like mass. First derivative, that's friction. Friction is resistance, except you get more friction if resistance is lower. You have to remember that. It's, it's not like you get more resistance and you get more friction. It's the other way around. So it's an analogy. Never forget you are in an analogy. It's not, a, it's not intuitive. It's just simple. 
It's just simple to remember. And then the fourth is an external bias. So individual well uh, and its curvature is related to uh, a plasma frequency. Uh, that would be the self oscillations of the ball inside here. So this is a formula you would get if you treat it as a pendulum. Okay, so uh, armed with that analogy, we can understand a little bit the uh, evolution of the IV curve. Remember, in the IV curve, we increase the bias, and there is no current flowing. Oh, uh, sorry, there is no voltage flowing, uh, developing. So we increase uh, uh, current bias, and the voltage remains zero. Now what is voltage? Voltage is defy dt. Yeah, so voltage would mean that a phase, which is now just simply called x, the coordinate has to change. But so at low bias, we are in this tilt, and the, the ball is in one of these uh, traps. And so we are tilting it a bit, but it's not coming out. It's staying here. So phase does not change. Therefore, the voltage is zero. So when does the voltage develop? When we tilt it so much that these uh, confinements are no longer there. When the curve became uh, flat on these parts and the ball, it was sitting here and it started to go boink, 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 starts to go. And uh, as it goes, we get the voltage. We get d phi dt in our equation. So this is right at the critical point, And then uh, as we keep increasing the force, we increase the tilt even more. And then the ball just goes faster and faster and faster. So this is simply considering the confinement in this potential. But remember, we also have friction, resistance, and we also have capacitance, the mass, the inertia. So let's first talk about uh, the uh, regime where Capacitance is small, uh, and um, resistance is large, uh, small, also small. So resistance is small. Uh, we have a very viscous uh, medium. Uh, friction is large. Resistance is small. Friction is large. Uh, that's when we get this uh, simplest IV curve, because um, I am tilting this potential, and at some point the ball starts to roll. And so I am just past the critical point, and the ball is rolling. And I tilt it back, and as soon as that force is gone, as soon as the little traps appear again, the ball is stuck again, because it has so much friction and so little inertia. It has uh, small capacitance and small resistance. Um, so then uh, the IV curve is very simple. Uh, supercurrent state, that's when we are trapped inside one trap. Then it starts to roll, but as soon as I trap it again, it goes back into the supercurrent state. So this is called the overdamped junction as opposed to the underdamped junction. The underdamped junction is when you have a lot of inertia or you have uh, a large resistance so very little friction. Then what happens is you tilt this washboard potential and you let the ball roll. And the ball is heavy and it doesn't care about friction. It just starts to go. And it actually is hard to stop it. You tilt it back, you already developed the traps, but it just goes over the traps because it has all this momentum. 
So this is what's shown here. You start and you don't go until you escape from the trap. You switch into the finite voltage state, but if you want to go back, it will take you some effort to stop the ball. So you have to reduce the bias way down, and you get this hysteretic behavior. So that's called underdamped, as it has a lot of inertia and you cannot stop the ball. So the, this analogy uh, helps you explain very easily uh, the hysteresis that people often see in Joseph's injunctions. So from the retrapping current, you can estimate the uh, capacitances and uh, the parameters of the junction. You can predict where this will occur from, the, from our RSJ model. Sometimes this part is rounded here. So that is like premature escape from the trap. Maybe there's a thermal excitation, so you still have a, a washboard, still has maxima and minima, but they are pretty shallow, and then thermal energy can kick you out. But remember, once you're out, the next minimum is lower, so you just start to go. So that's why there will be some switching before you reach the critical current, if the critical current is determined by the point where there is no minimum anymore in the trap. So we are still here, we still have minima, but we can escape. OK, now let's uh, think again about Shapiro steps. I promised you an explanation. Uh, this will get, again, a hand-waving explanation. I wish I brought a washboard with me. Uh, you will have to use a little bit your imagination here. but. Uh, once again, Shapiro steps are under the influence of uh, external radiation. Uh, we develop these resonances. And what are these resonances? It, it is that uh, we keep increasing the voltage, or we keep increasing the current, but the voltage doesn't change. It is a finite voltage, but it remains the same. So what is the voltage? Voltage is a rate at which this particle moves. So you keep increasing the tilt, but the particle moves at the same rate. The rate does not increase. That's what happens on the Shapiro step. So this is uh, data from uh, this paper. Without uh, excitation, they have this black curve, which is a little bit hysteretic, by the way. So this really does happen in experiments. But it doesn't have these uh, other steps. And under um, Radiation in the range of gigahertz, they start having these steps. So radiation can be modeled as you have to add a force which is time dependent and it's sinusoidal, it's periodic, to this potential. And what that does is it rocks it like that, it tilts it like that. So then there is a, actually a classical phenomenon, which is called phase locking, which tells you that um, if the, the, the force is a certain phase, then as you try to go over the well, if the force always pushes you back, you slow down a bit, and uh, it leads to a phase locking between the motion of this ball and this potential, such that uh, over each period of this force, you are only allowed to jump over one bump. That's because as you roll here with all your uh, momentum that you gained, the potential rocks backwards and pushes you back. So this, this classical phase locking phenomenon uh, leads to the fact that even though you increase the tilt, the, the rate at which you go is independent of that. It's dependent on uh, how fast the force is going. So uh, the force is going a little bit faster, then you uh, phase lock at a different frequency. But every, every period of this drive, you overcome one bump. Then what are these other steps? Well, that is also very simple. In one period, you shoot over two bumps. So there's a higher order of phase locking processes. Two bumps, three bumps, etc. 
So this is a way to think about uh, these Shapiro steps. Okay. This dramatic picture is uh, 3,020 Josephson junctions in a, in a long chain. And what they do with these junctions is they apply a microwave radiation, like in the last slide, but uh, they have 3,000 junctions for more accuracy. Uh, and what they do is they measure the voltages of Shapiro steps. And this happens to be how our society sets the standard for electric volt, for one volt. Because if you know the frequency with which you excite this system, then the voltage difference between Shapiro steps is determined by that frequency with fundamental constants, like 2e over h. And so this is the most accurate way we have to determine voltage, knowing just the fundamental constants. Because we can very accurately measure and create different frequencies, we can use our ability to create frequencies to uh, very accurately measure volts. And so they do it at the NIST, National Institute of Standards, using Josephson devices, and using Shapiro steps, actually, to measure the standard of volt. Now, the last couple of minutes, uh, I would like to play with this um, analogy a little bit longer. Uh, I think this is a very uh, beautiful result, and uh, this is what's driven uh, the field of superconducting qubits for the last two decades. So what do we have? We have a, a ball with a mass, and uh, this ball has, is described by coordinate in one-dimensional space, which is phase. So if we... Uh, make the mass of this ball smaller and smaller and lower the temperature, we might go into a quantum regime, right? Where it should be described by the uncertainty principle between the momentum and the coordinate. And I already substituted delta phi for the coordinate because we know what that is. Now what is momentum? Momentum is m, the mass, times x dot, which is phi dot. Which is this, which is this, which is this. This is the charge. So the uncertainty principle is actually between the charge and the phase. Or between the number of Cooper pairs and the phase difference across the junction. So if you know the charge very well, you completely don't know the phase. Or if you know the phase very well, like you set it in from a flux loop, charge is completely unknown. So you can, uh, you know, I introduced it to you as a kind of a mental exercise. Let's play with the RSJ model and derive this uncertainty principle. But it happens to be a very fundamental property uh, these two quantities really are connected by this uncertainty principle and you can measure it in experiments. You can measure the quantum mechanical behavior of a phase particle. You can also make a connection between the quantum me mechanical properties of the phase and the fluctuating charges. But today I will just show you this part. And then in the next lecture we will talk about the the other quantum experiments. So this is what I just described. Uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can fix the phase or you can fix the charge and what determines that is the ratio between the Josephson energy and the charging energy. So if you have a very large Josephson energy and the charging energy is negligible, that means that uh, the charge is fixed. There's no uncertainty there. And so you get uh, uh, superpositions of phase states, superpositions of phase particle in this washboard potential. And uh, if uh, Josephson energy dom uh, is dominated by a charging energy, 
you can see superpositions of charges over the Josephson junction, but the phase will be fixed. And there is also a continuous spectrum of devices from this extreme to this extreme. The experiment I will talk about today is called macroscopic quantum tunneling, and it is uh, treating this uh, washboard potential as a potential barrier and uh, trying to see the particle going from here to here, quantum mechanically, by tunneling, not by jumping over. So the way they actually do it is they bias the Josephson junction close to the tipping point. And so after the particle has tunneled, it just uh, goes, it runs. It goes into the running state. So what they had to measure is simply a voltage uh, developing across the junction. So the switch into the finite voltage state. So this is a... Um, very beautiful and to me very important paper that maybe one of the first demonstrated quantum properties in the Josephson junction related to the phase dynamics. And what they've measured is uh, the distribution of switching voltages for Josephson junction as a function of temperature. And the, the width of that distribution, so they measure a thousand times at which bias did the junction switch. Um, and uh, that, dis that width of that distribution closely followed temperature for high temperatures. So escape from this well to the running state was just temperature broadened events. So you get energy from temperature and jump out and starts to run. But then they started lowering the temperature more and more. The temperature kept dropping, but the escape rate, the distribution of those escape rates, saturated. So even though it should be harder and harder to escape if you don't have energy to jump over. It happened to be equally easy below a certain temperature. And they've attributed it to macroscopic quantum tunneling processes. I encourage you to read this paper. It's very easily written, especially if you know the washboard potential idea. And uh, to me, uh, you know, the washboard itself is created by quantum mechanical processes. The Josephson effect is a fundamentally quantum mechanical effect, tunneling of wave functions from one superconductor to the other. But now what we have done is we have defined a new degree of freedom, this quantum particle, which is a phase difference, and we observe the quantum mechanical behavior of that degree of freedom. So we have layered layers of quantum of, on top of each other. And uh, much of the modern condensed matter physics has to do with layering quantum on top of quantum. What was considered quantum in the 1960s, we now call it classical, the Josephson effect itself. And quantum is the superpositions of phase particle. And we will dedicate another lecture to that, but for now I will stop.